Greetings class. Welcome back to another uh, session here as we study TESOL methods. In particular, we're looking at the Kala uh, approach to language teaching. And today we're going to be looking at assessing uh, student progress. Again, this comes out of this handbook here by Anshal uh, Shema. Um, I believe that's uh, how the pronunciation. Um, so I would recommend you do get the book. Uh, today, again, we're going to be looking at uh, the legislation involved and why um, assessments are becoming more pronounced in the public school systems. We're also going to look at how we use assessments in the color classroom and then some possible alternatives in the color classroom. Let's jump right into uh, some of the legislation that's involved. As you probably have heard before, there is the uh, act to encourage um, academic excellence in the public school system entitled No Child Left Behind was developed by former Senator Ted Kennedy and former President George uh, W. Bush. And within this system, they wanted to raise the standards for everyone. They were going to do this by doing um, testing, assessment, to find out where these students are and where they should be. All students are being tested now <clears throat> throughout their academic career in the public school system. Data is collected on all of the uh, students, and in particular for ESL students, Data is collected about their family languages. Um, now, the No Child Left Behind did have some negative impact. Uh, there were some schools that couldn't progress as quickly as others because of the nature of the students that they had. There were ESL students in particular were going to be a drag on a school because of their, um, their background, although there is some room to... Uh, provide for that uh, made it more difficult. In addition, the amount of uh, testing that is now going on can be a, um, a, lo a, m a motivation killer for some students. Um, in addition, the pressure on schools to perform. If they do not do well in their schools, they could lose funding. So there is a lot of uh, pressure there. It's a good idea, in my opinion, to do the testing. Not know that the government should be the one, the federal government should be the one doing that. In any event, uh, the No Child Left Behind Act was a uh, had a big impact on ESL uh, teaching in the United States. The No Child Left Behind Act also has requirements for um, limited English proficiency (LEP) uh, students. T schools are now required to identify the language of the students that they that they have at home. Um, they're also required to develop academic and English assessments for the students so they can identify where the students are and where the students need to go. Then they have to identify what the students um, academic, I'm sorry, English proficiency is. So they have to test the students language ability. And then of course they need to include uh, proficiency and performance scores with the rest of the school. So they're testing everyone and for our students in particular they're testing their abilities, and then they're including those scores in with the rest of the school. So it is, become, it is incumbent upon us uh, teachers of second language learners to do well so that we don't ha drag down the scores of the rest of the school. Those are some of the things that are involved with um, ESL learners and the No Child Left Behind Act. Now, as I said, there are going to be people who are not happy that they're being forced to take tests. They're not happy that they're being forced to um, add additional assessments, especially if they're doing well in their schools. It's simply extra work for them, and I understand that. We, of course, have to live with it. We have to work with it. And uh, again, it can be a, a big plus for our students because it does require us to develop assessments and um, guidelines for helping them improve and getting into mainstream courses. Uh, regarding the assessment of uh, the color in the color classroom, we as teachers need to assess what's going on with our students. That, that seems rather obvious, and there are some things that we can do to help students do well in classes. For example, we can provide special accommodations for them. Um, if we are dealing with a particular content area, we may need to modify our vocabulary. We may need to modify the uh, the, the complexity of the grammar that we're using. We may need to modify the directions that we have so that it's easier for them to understand. Younger students might be better uh, at having uh, more graphic pictures, <coughs> um, graphics and pictures to understand. You might allow them to use glossaries or dictionaries. Other things that we can do is provide them extra time, extra space. Some schools actually set aside space when students are doing exams and whatnot so that there is less pressure for them. There are other things that we can do to help students with standardized tests. And that's what the No Child Left Behind tests are. They are standardized tests. And uh, 
uh, ELLs, English language learners, may need extra help, extra encouragement, because this may all be new to them. So one thing that we can do is uh, motivate them. Give them the encouragement that they need to let them know they can survive. You can also teach them things like time management, test-taking skills. Time management, not only for studying, but also for taking the exams, how to take the exams and how to take them well. Test-taking skills, how to uh, take a, a multiple-choice test, uh, things that you should look for, and then allow them to practice taking those tests um, before they're actually done. You can also do have them practice learning strategies. And again, that's a big thing in Kella is learning strategies, because you can have them practice that. You can encourage them to review for the tests. And then, of course, we at, in the schools can use a variety of assessments, not just uh, the standardized tests to do the assessment, but we can use other forms of assessment to find out how well our students are doing and how close they're getting to becoming mainstream. Um, not everyone does well with tests. Not everyone is adept at understanding academic lingo and per performing well on a standardized test. But there are many other ways to do assessments. And uh, uh, Shema and the Kala approach uh, recommend alternative assessments, and there are others that do as well. I believe that by uh, providing alternative assessments, you as a teacher get a better picture of your students' knowledge, skills, and abilities, because it's not one layer. <clears throat> Some will look at assessment as a black and white type of thing, whereas others will want to see layers upon layers of analysis that you can use to look and see and focus in better on what a student can actually do and know. Language is not a, a single layered type of entity. It is multifaceted. So to have um, multiple assessments, it gives you a richer description of what the student is actually learning. So it would be wise to have multiple assessments. Uh, it's similar to when you have a rubric when you're doing a writing uh, assessment. You're assessing students' writing. You can assess their uh, you can assess their lexical choice. You can assess their writing uh, conventions. You can assess uh, their creativity. You can assess their research capabilities. Uh, and all of these, they're layer upon layer to give you a better picture of how a student is uh, performing a writing task. So it is with just um, uh, language learning in general. You'll be able to, sh uh, when you do multiple assessments, you'll be able to show not only the product, but also the process. You'll, you'll be able to see the richness of something, the diversity of uh, the student's learning, because you have multiple assessments. So I would recommend that when you're dealing with students, that you do try to provide multiple assessments to get a better picture. Uh, the research term would be to get some sort of triangulation uh, of a student's abilities. Now, how does one design alternative, alternative assessments? Four basic steps. You're going to construct the assessment and then administer it, score it, and then interpret it. Now, in the construction phase, you'll be dealing with, th with things like what are the objectives of the assessment? How are the objectives going to be measured? How are they going to be tested? How are we going to score um, this assessment? And then, of course, how do we interpret the data afterwards? But all that needs to be thought of during the construction process. Um, so, for example, if you're doing a, um, uh, giving a student a speaking test, uh, you're, you could be looking at their word choice, you could be worth looking at their grammar uh, usage, you could be looking at their fluency, you could be looking at their uh, presence, or, you know, do they have eye contact, are they, do they have confidence. So there are a number of things that you could be testing. How, in fact, are you going to be testing that when you do this? And then, after you're done building the objectives that you want to test, the actual uh, test and in, 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 uh, the actual test item that you're going to be using, and how it's going to be uh, scored, then you actually have to administer the test. And after you do the test, you're going to score it. And I re do recommend that you try to have some form of rubric um, in place. Uh, Kala would also, uh, Shema would also suggest that you have different forms of rubrics so that you can check off the things or mark the things or provide certain scores for the materials that they do create. And then lastly, you're going to interpret that data. Um, the interpretation of the data may mean that the students are learning or they're not learning. It may mean that the test is not good if everybody is doing very badly and you find out that it's not because they're not studying. It may be that the test is is uh, need of improvement, need of revision. But that's the normal process that you're going to go through. 
Uh, lastly, um, uh, you could be using a portfolio. A portfolio is, a, a, you all know what a portfolio is, a number of activities slash writing slash projects that are put into a folder to represent the student's ability throughout the entire semester. Um, and that may be another form of assessment that you may want to use. Now, I'm not suggesting that because you're using a portfolio that you're going to abandon the more traditional objective forms. That's another layer in this process. And I would recommend that you continue using things like uh, vocabulary quizzes or essay writing or uh, your more traditional style of uh, assessment, but you need to add to that other forms uh, of assessment as well. And uh, that's all I have for the Kala Assessing Student Progress uh, chapter. There are a number of good rubrics and samples in this particular chapter, so I do recommend that you go look at those. And if you do have any questions, you can certainly give me a call or check me out on email. Thank you. Bye-bye.